Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the President, Sir Stephen Dalton, and actually I was with him for 10 minutes this morning and he gave his uh, huge apologies, he couldn't be himself. It's my pleasure you, to welcome you all on behalf of the Royal Aeronautical Society to this evening's lecture. The Society exists for its members. It has two main functions in that regard, to represent the views and voices of our members in society and to provide a conduit to keep our members current in all aspects of aviation. We're all members of the wide aviation profession, whether engineers, aircrew, air traffic controllers, project managers, we're all united by a love of aircraft and all things aviation. Being the representative body for such a dedicated and knowledgeable group of people, we remain relevant and in touch. So what are we doing to remain relevant as in the Aerosoc today? Well, we're very active in the policy area canvassing our members through the specialist branch groups and the branches in order to respond to government inquiries and studies and to be an active voice where we think that the sector is at risk. That's particularly the case at the moment over Brexit. And you would wish to know that we're very active in providing factual analysis on key areas of Brexit policy, such as making sure that the debate on things like membership or not of EASA is based on fact rather than opinion. Aviation today faces huge change and unprecedented challenges, whether it's meeting the production rate ramp up if you're a supplier, with Airbus and Boeing both predicted to ramp up to over 70 aircraft a month on the 320 series and the 737 MAX respectively, whether you're meeting the next requirement for a customer for a state-of-the-art ISR platform based on a civil regional jet, whether you're looking to change the entire technology for your propulsion system to get away from a high carbon footprint, or if you're in the business of providing the next personal autonomous air vehicle. For all of these things, the Royal Air and Nautical Society needs to remain relevant, and we primarily do so through our programme of lectures and conferences. We do hold a number of lectures and conferences at Fort Hamilton Place, but the lifeblood of what we do is the branches and the specialist groups, and they enable us to access the widest body of knowledge to allow us to inform and be informed. So from, on behalf of and from the Royal Aeronautical Society headquarters, a great vote of thanks to your branch committee, and especially to Peter Jenkins and Mike Gregory uh, for setting up the arrangements for tonight. Thanks also to Sir Michael and Robert and to the Marshall Group for sponsoring the named lecture. I certainly regard my year at uh, uh, Marshall very fondly and we at the Royal Aeronautical Society are particularly appreciative of the support of the family and of the company for all our endeavours. So it's with great pleasure then that I move on to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Air Commodore Al Seymour always wanted to fly. He started at the age of seven his dad's Piper Super Cub. How many of us wish our dad had an aeroplane? <laughs> and thence on, on through an RAF flying scholarship and on to university and the University Air Squadron. Along the way, he earned a degree in materials science and engineering metallurgy at Manchester University, and then went on to do his flying training through the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Programme and a year in, with the US United States Air Force in Texas. He then came back to the RAF to fly the Tornado F3, uh, and along the way qualify as a, a qualified weapons instructor. He did an exchange tour on F-18 with the Royal Australian Air Force, and then on to the Eurofighter Typhoon. He's commanded the Typhoon OCU, and after the obligatory staff training and staff jobs, he's interspersed operational tours with roles in the Air Warfare Center, which he now commands. He has more than 3,400 hours of flight time with around 2,500 on fast jets. And anybody who knows anything about Tornado means that's an awful lot of flying and a few breakdowns along the way. In his spare time, if he has any, he keeps fit through his interest in road cycling and he's president of the RAF Cycling Association. Tonight, he's going to talk to us about what is probably the ultimate computer game, the Air Battle Space Training Centre. Air Commodore Al Seymour. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Sir Michael. And uh, I don't think I could quite top that. When, when I... Um, when I listen uh, to any intro like uh, the good admirals just uh, offered, I kind of think, did that really happen? 
Um, and, and more to the point, uh, being asked to come and speak uh, in a lecture theatre in Cambridge, I guarantee you, is something that 25 years ago no one would have bet good money on. So, you know, the reality is, I suppose, I'm more someone that's interested in doing the doing rather than thinking about the thinking. But what I'm going to try and sort of bring to you as we go through this uh, lecture today is as much about the why do we want to do the reinforcement of the conceptual component through the work we do in simulation, and in particular the ABTC. But more broadly, I'd welcome um, questions at the end in relation to what does it mean for us in the future as we look ever more to the live virtual and synthetic mix to get to a capability, not just uh, as I might have wished we'd done it 25 years ago, for example. Now, um, many of you will perhaps uh, come from an experience or uh, a working environment that has had a great deal of involvement and having read some of the bios I know a lot of you are academically linked to what we've done with synthetics in the past and what I will say to you is technically I'm not an expert I'm an experienced operator um, leader commander that has utilized the capability over many many years and I think I can understand uh, the cause and effect the benefit that this can give us uh, as, a, as a future way of uh, preparing our people for war fighting duties. So um, what, what you'll find I will do, and there are some in the audience that have heard me speak before, um, I kind of get seized on things and get really quite animated and excited. And so I'll come out and I'll look at you and I'll get quite close and I might even get a bit shouty. Sometimes I'm gonna have to refer to my notes uh, because some of the history that you will find interesting um, isn't in my working knowledge. So we'll just talk through some of that as we go. Uh, please, if we have questions, we'll save them to the end. And I'm not sure we, what we didn't arrange was if I'm running late, because that's a, that's a weapons instructor's prerogative, you know. If I start to get late, someone needs to shout and say, right, move on. So without further ado, um, it's Michael, we'll move on. So uh, part of what we're going to talk about uh, today is going to be the history of the uh, uh, Air Battle Training Centre um, what it looks like now, uh, typical air training within it, and then uh, some typical land, land uh, component training. A as with everything in life, there are constraints. There are both opportunities, weaknesses, but, but in particular, um, what, what we're going to try and draw out through some of the examples is the, the benefit, but also um, some of the uh, factors that we've, we're still working on in truth in that balance between live and synthetic uh, training. And then what, what I potentially will uh, try and draw out a little bit more is how do we bridge out of what is currently the ABTC into the future of synthetics? And again, what I'll, what I'll try and um, impress upon you is perhaps in the past, people have viewed uh, the benefit of simulation synthetics as a cost-saving measure. Um, not presented in this, but uh, in my experience is that's not necessarily the case. Uh, conversation before the lecture spoke to the benefit of having human in the loop here, and, and we can't ever get away from that. And of course, when you have very experienced, trained people that have an operational mindset, that comes at a cost, and that cost never leaves us. Um, it's why we do what we do uh, to build that experience base. So um, I'll try and draw all of that together and pull a golden thread, if you like, through the presentation. So uh, we start off with uh, really what is the Air Battle Training Centre and where is it? So uh, the Air, Air Battle Training Centre is based at uh, RF Waddington uh, in one hangar there and it, it is primarily a collective training facility. Um, when we look at the differences between an individual versus team versus collective, you might look back to the view of uh, you know, early days of aviation where we're just training a single individual in a simulator. You know, I spent a lot of my time in simulators in the past, and I'm the one that's getting the benefit. Um, I suppose you could say some of my instructors got the benefit too, but uh, it was predominantly me. When we start looking at uh, the team, then we bridge out to the kind of facility that uh, I enjoyed as uh, the commander of the Typhoon OCU, where I had a series of simulator devices of, of higher and lower fidelity, where I could tune the training that was focused on getting a formation able to deliver a capability or um, target in a more effective way. So really quite focused still. And then now we're talking more what the uh, Air War, uh, 
the Air Battle Training uh, Centre is all about, which is the collective environment. So now it's not just about the individual, it's not just about the one team, but it's then about the team of teams. So it's a more systemic approach, if you like, to how we can uh, train. And that's particularly important when we start looking at really why um, the ABTC was put in place. A and, and that was to get to not just the air component, but also the land component with joint fires uh, in particular. And that's what you will find as we look at this uh, graphic here. Um, it's, it's a great little bird's eye view of, uh, of the facility, but inside a hangar space, you have uh, you know, a significant amount of infrastructure that looks to a number of cockpits, more of which later, a number of uh, environments that replicate uh, what you would expect our land component colleagues and joint fire teams to experience. And we try and immerse them to a degree, almost fool the mind, again, a conversation before the lecture. There's a psychology to this as well that we need to consider. So we're training the mind, not necessarily the body in this sense. So this is where I'm going to refer to a bit of notes um, in respect of where the, where the history is. So just looking at the crest, um, what you'll see there is a, is a, is a wheel with um, uh, the globe inside it. And this is representing, if you like, um, the constant wheel of development or change. And when we look at this, the genesis of... Uh, that crest is set and indeed is, is replicated from the Air Fighting Development Unit, or AFDU, which was formed in initially at RAF Northolt in October 1934. The crest comprises of that uh, globe in front of the wheel and the progressive nature, if you like, a rolling forward um, of capability is then applied over the, the global context. So as part of that central flying establishment, the AFDU, um, was then renamed the Air Fighting Development Squadron in 1944 and has had many notable commanding officers over its, uh, over its lifetime. And uh, indeed, for those that are historians, it was responsible for the development of some of those key war wartime uh, fighter capabilities um, and, and went on in time uh, to reform at uh, Lapsley in 1949. Uh, so as... Uh, as the squadron then based itself at West Rain, it was responsible for the development of tactics and operational evaluation, um, particularly on uh, Tempest, Vamp Vampire, Meteor, Swift and uh, Javelin. And then uh, finally relocating at Binbrook to conduct a considerable amount of tactical research on the Lightning uh, before being finally disbanded in February of 1966. And so there's a big air gap, if you like, between where we then went to with the ABTC, but it seemed appropriate to lift that uh, fine history of development and uh, tactics, in particular uh, tactics development and training into the current context. And I never did get a flight in a lightning. That's the one that got away. <laughs> okay, so um, let, let's have a quick look at uh, what, it, what it is now. So um, starting off with um, the, the notion of a program that's this uh, distributed synthetic air land training program, DESALT, in other words, so uh, the ABTC is the embodiment of DESALT, if you like. It's the enduring um, synthetic environment uh, hub for training within that facility. And the synthetic environment itself uh, is a local network, uh, again, based out of that hangar, but has the ability to reach out to other nodes. So if you like, as as we go back to that crest and we look at the wheel of um, progress and the global context, the fact that it can be uh, linked into other um, providers uh, and other synthetic environments is hugely uh, important to them. And so the collective training is in, in a sense benefiting an individual, notwithstanding what I said to start with, but predominantly we're looking for the wider training benefits. Now, those of that um, recall the, the, uh, the early turn of the century with the Afghan uh, campaign will recognize that we had to do things quickly, and so we started to innovate. And what we recognized going into that campaign was that we were starting to put a lot of people in harm's way, and in particular, uh, the benefit of having um, forward air controllers on the ground controlling joint fires was critical to our success in that campaign. And so this f facility, and reading my notes precisely, says it was hijacked 
uh, in order to deliver that capability. And um, as someone who's um, both served on the ground in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, seen quite a bit of interest from a command and control perspective from the higher headquarters as well. Um, the benefits of this kind of facility, emerging uh, the foot soldier into an environment where you can stress them mentally um, without putting them in danger physically is hugely important. And, and that idea about then how we develop this DSOL into a, a five-year forward program uh, at the back of the Iraq-Afghanistan operations allowed us to really focus on that airland integration uh, interface and development of, again, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And interestingly, um, allowed us to develop a way to uh, present a, a capability assurance message for formed units that we're about to deploy. So um, in, in sum, a fantastic um, uh, capability that over time has been honed uh, for great success. Now, uh, again, we go back to this notion of um, equipment doesn't, doesn't always give you uh, the solution that you want. I, I'm a firm believer in, and, and have practiced this on many occasions, in the fact that the environment, the simulation, is only as good as the staff that are running it, that are planning the exercises, that are mo monitoring and men mentoring. Uh, and in, and in this, this instance, what I provide to the ABTC specifically is the white force element. We have those operationally experienced, um, technically accomplished individuals that have been in the fight. So again, we're bringing people on with an experience base that says, okay, here's the theory, but in practice, what does that look like for us? Um, on the, on the left-hand side of the slide, as you look at it, what you will um, perhaps pick up here and, and when I looked at the slides in the car on the way down, because that's kind of how, how quick this came to me, um, what I saw here was that actually my good colleague, Lowell Bennett, should be giving you this presentation, not me, because the ABTC actually works for him. No, the truth is they were, they're coming across to my side of the organisation of the operations pillar. Um, and the key there at the bottom, you'll see on the left-hand side, is uh, 92 Squadron. And uh, 92 Squadron is my uh, system specialists across air uh, domain with, with a couple of ALI experts. And they're the folk that are very experienced in uh, both training operators at that single individual level, but also um, facilitating collective training. Um, mostly, if not all, weapons instructors or, or qualified helicopter instructors, but um, very experienced in the uh, practice of planning for and exercising um, training events. When you look at the ABTC, uh, it's a whole force team, and uh, I'm not sure if we have people here who have experienced um, what that means, but is it, is it an impact of defense cuts? No, I would say it's not. I would say it's uh, a, a recognition that we can bring the strength of industry and experts that aren't in the service to bear, but also leveraging um, in place in places as well, reserve forces. So the whole force um, construct is about building a team for success and the management and the staff within the ABTC um, work both across defense and uh, industry alike. And what you'll see when uh, you look closely at the ops team element, my point is not very bright here, but in particular here, is uh, a company named Inspire. Now, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that company, not to promote them, but just to show the benefits of uh, why military service is a good thing for a lot of people and how it can benefit uh, the nation uh, from an enduring perspective. And then that also links back to the fine cadets that I um, said hello to on the way in. And we often think that, in, and again, I, I said I'm passionate about certain things, and I'm going to step away from the lectern slightly because this is, this is something that I truly believe in. And it goes a little bit to... Uh, one of the introductions. You know, fundamentally, exposure and experience within a whole force, whether it's from a cadet all the way through to some of our you know, uh, esteemed colleagues in the audience, is all about the nation. It's protecting the nation and about people we care about. Inspire was formed by three of my very good friends and colleagues over a meal and a glass of wine. And they said, what could we do to do this better without the constraints of the defence 
process. And, and I'm kind of just going to do a show of hands here, um, not just to keep you awake, but because I'm interested. Who has been involved in defence procurement? Okay. Who feels entirely satisfied by that? <laughs> okay. So here's the deal. It takes time. There's a reason it takes time, because we're spending public money. And, and it's right and proper that we take our time and we're very careful with it. But that's not an agile thing. It's really difficult to be agile through that process. And if you're a training provider or if you're a service provider, not just making something, if you have an intellectual ability to provide something that would cost us a great deal of money in the service to generate, then that's, if you like, the, the basic foundation, foundation principle of Inspire as a company formed by three weapons instructors and uh, an analyst and, uh, of, of great uh, technical um, repute. And they've built that company up now over the last 10 years um, to, to a company that employs 125 people, all of whom add value to not just defence but the nation across all pillars. Now, why is that important? I could not deliver what we do in the ABTC without those people. Now, you could say that's something that um, is a bad thing, but actually I embrace it because they're always here. They're not deployed off. They don't have to go to America to go and do something or to Holland. or to, you know, They are there when we need them, and, and that's a fantastic capability. But similarly, um, the, the fact that we've got the Royal Air Force crest there as well says that we've got to have recency. So, again, when I go back out, you know, the contemporary warfighting environment or what's coming next means that we need people who have been in the latest fight to come back in and share those lessons and exactly the way that we do those. And we can't, as always, you know, I spent my life being supported by engineers um, and indeed I owe my life to engineers, thank you, uh, built amazing things for us and um, the fact that we can do what we do is because we've got a fantastic engineering team uh, behind us. So a typical year, um, it would be hugely appealing to have this facility running uh, constantly. But with all things, a bit like your car as you drive it in, you get your service light on every once in a while, you've got to take stock, come back uh, from delivering uh, any exercise. But in essence, when we look at the 52-week um, breakdown, what you'll see is that uh, 44 of those 52 weeks were, were operating the facility and delivering meaningful collective training. Six of those weeks are, are down to maintenance and tech uh, refresh, and then uh, the clever amongst you will go, well, that's an add to 52, so we do give a stand down sometime around Christmas, I believe. Um, but that's a benefit as well because it allows the team to recuperate. And when we look at the breakdown of um, the task loading, uh, again, it's equally balanced with uh, 19 weeks predominantly focused on joint fires uh, for land forces and then another 19 weeks um, for the Royal Air Force. And there's a little bit of live training and uh, exercise development activity that goes on throughout that process. Okay, so <clears throat> you probably can't see these at the back, but there's, everyone likes pictures of aeroplanes and things that go bang and um, great technology. What, what, what we're trying to present here is that um, one of the benefits of uh, synthetics is that you can, can present a very uh, complicated environment. You can have a huge number of entities, um, you know, hundreds and thousands, whereas uh, in, the, in the real world they're in increasingly difficult to come by. So if we start looking at uh, you know, what we would typically see in the air environment, we can actually replicate that for all the joint fires environment too. Uh, it, it's just overlaid. And of course, the benefit of uh, synthetics, again, I'm, I'm trying to track down one of uh, your colleagues that we were chatting to earlier, a uh, good doctor, is the fact that we can slow time down or we can speed it up. And, and that's a fantastic facility in relation to some of the things that we need to do on occasion through the training environment. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, as a weapons instructor, in many cases, the most valuable aspect of anything that we do is the debrief. It's kind of interesting, 
to look at how people plan, but invariably what we tend to do is just let them develop a plan. And then provided that they can execute a plan in a live environment or in a static that's safe or, or can get to the mission, then we just let it go. One of my, um, again, just, just going slightly segueing, one of my, one of my enduring frustrations as a, as a, a pilot on, on the front line uh, and an instructor was when people thought they knew better. And I'm sure we've all experienced that in, in life and they have to intervene. Uh, it really doesn't help anyone to intervene at a point where learning cannot occur. And, uh, and I've done this with my own kids. I just have to let them get off and do their own thing and, and they'll make mistakes and they'll learn from them and I have to be careful how I point those out to them. But invariably, we get to a point where we say, okay, what did you learn from that? And, uh, and, and this is predominantly what we're looking for through that um, debriefing uh, process. So the, the, the full and enriched opportunity that synthetics, and in particular uh, the, the style that we have at the APTC offer, is this whole after-action review that's uh, 3D replicated. So who, th who thinks in 3D? I mean, I hope everyone. Um, you know, we, we, we're kind of designed to do that. Uh, but, but the reality is we kind of do that retrospectively. We kind of go, yeah, the, the lizard brain is doing the processing all the time. The cognitive brain isn't really doing that. We're, we're kind of thinking about other things sometimes. What, what we can do with the simulation and, uh, is really get to not just the eye view of the individual, but the, the team view and then the collective view. So within the debrief, um, from a record uh, perspective, we, everything is on mic. It's a bit like me now. I, I'm going to hate looking at myself and debriefing how I'm presenting to you. Let me just tell you that because there's learning occurring. But the reality is uh, all actions are recorded and they're stored. So as we look to the totality of how the plan was executed uh, in this sense, you have the opportunity to go back to that time-based um, issue where you can just speed through it. And sometimes when you can speed through things, you see the glaringly obvious. Uh, and then refocus back on some key areas. And typically, uh, what we'll end up looking at is some, some uh, key focused learning uh, objectives that we're trying to get out through the, through the debrief in particular. So I think perhaps uh, as we sort of move out from the sort of totality of what it is, where it is, um, what benefits it can offer us, let's just draw out a few examples. So uh, typical air exercise, what, what might that look like? Um, a, an air exercise can be as, as small as two, two ships, uh, two, four ships of fast jet, or it can be as complicated as having um, a distributed and linked series of cockpits um, that look to uh, a JSTAR simulator in the US uh, typhoon uh, emulators, uh, cockpits within the hangar, an E3D uh, simulator emulator linked into the picture, type 45 simulator. Um, we've even done underwater warfare uh, simulators linked into the, to the process. And then as far as the Red Force is concerned, because although we're quite friendly with them at the moment, I don't think I could ring up um, uh, Putin and say, do you mind if I just link into your flanker sims? Instead, what we have is desktop uh, synthetics. So part of my White Force team rebadge themselves, put a red hat on, and then go and fly as, uh, as the uh, Red Force. And we'll also have a ground environment that also simulates that for us. As we build those packages up, you know, the art of um, testing through those uh, training weeks is, uh, you know, we've always done this in, in the military, is a building block approach. So we'll start to set those objectives quite narrow. We'll focus in on what it is that we want them to uh, understand to begin with, which might be the planning and timing uh, process. And then we'll build it out and add complexity. And again, we can adjust that depending on the performance that we see through debrief. Um, right now, just to put it in, in context, uh, there's a big exercise going on in Nevada um, in, in flying out of Nellis called Exercise Red Flag. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. So, so I've got um, 
nearly all of my white force out uh, helping with the US. And typically, we're seeing 110, 120 aircraft airborne at any one time. Now, I wouldn't even, well, I probably could do the maths, but there's an awful lot of money being spent out there. And the reason we do it live as well is because you know what? We've done it in a virtual space first. So those individuals that are going into those mission plans through the building block approach, because they do a, a walk, uh, run, sprint um, approach, they've been able to test and adjust how they personally do it, how they, from a team perspective, do it, and then collectively. Mind you, they do seem to forget. It's a short space of time, don't they? But uh, maybe that's uh, nerves. Who knows? Um, similarly, then, if we uh, turn that around and say, well, if what does this look like if you if you're going to pitch that for a, a you know a, a bit like the red flag, the big annual exercise? Um, in this instance, it's exercise uh, red kite and. The team have got very um, proficient in building up the environment, building up the entity uh, mix to provide a really rich, um, a really rich exercise that we can drag an awful lot out of. And this then becomes a linked and networked, uh, uh, you know, synthetic training event with uh, the U.S. and more broadly, not just the ABTC but other um, simulator environments. So as an example, in 2017, uh, we had uh, Typhoon and E3D, E3D uh, Sentry simulators linked in. Uh, type 45, as I mentioned before, Sea King Whiskey. We had uh, US CV-22, AC-130s, and the Canadian Air Force uh, F-18. Um, it was a fictional uh, scenario, but contemporary. In other words, the names are being changed to protect the innocent, and the ge geography had you know, been moved around a little bit. But fundamentally, we were looking at a near-peer adversary. Um, a near-peer, what do I mean by that? In the past, the West has spent a great deal of its defence budget trying to stay technologically advanced uh, ahead of its perceived threat. What we're seeing now, uh, and, and you more than any, I think, would appreciate this, is that um, the interconnected world and the sort of uh, ability for uh, other nations to look at what we do, uh, both from an open source perspective, but frankly from a nefarious perspective as well, means that their technology is really rising rapidly in comparison to ours. We've just about got the edge right now, just about, but it, you know it won't be long. So again, part of the benefit of understanding how we uh, can operate collectively is to say, well, if their technology is the same, ish as ours, what's what's the real war-winning capability that we're trying to get to? And I come back to the people and the mind. And so the more we can do this, the better we can uh, get, not just practiced but conceptually in the right place. So um, this exercise in particular was a two-week-long exercise, um, and. It was set around having a sort of a two-day heartbeat. A normal ATO cycle lasts 72 hours. So it's a little bit longer than that. Uh, the ATO cycle is a little bit longer than the two-day period. But what it allowed us to do was get a volume of people through the facility. So again, trying to tap into as many brains as we possibly could and, and give them an experience that's beneficial. And um, when we look at uh, how we uh, provide the, the planning facilities and the way that we expect them to draw a plan together and then uh, exercise the, uh, the plan itself, it's, it really as they would do out on the front line for real. Um, with those uh, distributed assets as well, and, and this is something else that relates directly to how we oper operate for real, is the, the, the benefits of uh, VTC. So they are both planning and briefing and debriefing with the benefits of, uh, of uh, VTC as well. The other thing that I suppose we've used in, in uh, synthetics, when we're training individuals in simulation or, or simulator synthetics, we tend to try and do it in the shortest space of time possible. You get the most bang for your buck. Um, 
Again, my experience of that is pretty much the hour is about where you want to be. My last IRT in a typhoon in the sim lasted nearly two hours. I wasn't, I wasn't thankful for that. But th the reality is what we, what we see in operations is vols that bridge across the three to seven hour period. Um, yeah, flying a fighter for seven hours on operations at any one time, you kind of learn techniques about how to handle that. But the reality is we don't put them into that position, um, but we do stress them up to the three hour point. And again, that's really to try and get them to understand how they can focus when they need to focus and when they can just settle. Be slightly mind. Who, who practices any mindfulness? I, maybe a few of you are right now. But I mean, the, the, re the reality is, it's quite a useful technique to know when you can take the brain down off that high level of alert, down slightly to then when you, can, you need, really need to fire it back up. So again, a great facility to do that. Uh, all around this facility as well, uh, as far as building the exercise, you see a typical entity count of in the hundreds. Um, is the environment that we're trying to build to. So that really means when we're, we're looking at the assets, we're looking at uh, fighter aircraft, we're looking at strike assets, um, suppression of enemy uh, air defence type assets, ISR, uh, air to air refuelling assets, command and control, uh, KOC, of course. Um, KOC, yes, my favourite phrase uh, from chariot, haul off. That was my denied kill, never mind. Um, and then uh, the, the enemy threat, red SAMs, and of course the red air uh, threat throughout. So it's enriching the environment to make it um, mentally stimulating, but also uh, challenging, of course. From a land training perspective, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of Big deal exercise, Steel Dragon, a five-day exercise um, based around battery commanders and their joint fire teams. So it's how do we coordinate best those joint fires. Running 16 um, per year, and typically we're seeing uh, 35 um, personnel with up to 10 to 15 augmentees throughout the, that period. Um, again, fictitious countries, uh, but very much focused down into that joint fire team environment. Um, However, in order to make it representative, and this goes back to the how do we innovate and how do we get people trained for the contemporary uh, fight, um, we do use actually some uh, geographical databases from Norman Hellman Shire. Um, and, and similarly, as we look to the, the process, then uh, we simulate the five-day process of, uh, our, um, of how they would insert into a theatre screen delay, defend, and attack. And typically, we set the, the threat at a fourth-gen opponent. And what do I mean by that? Again, it's a near peer. It's a contemporary environment, not yet into the next generation. So uh, again, what, what we're seeing here is the enriched environment that we, we typically can't get within uh, the live flying or live exercise environment. What I want to emphasise, though, um, whilst I said we, we've got a, data, a trained database that is North Helmand, um, it's not mission rehearsal, so we're not using live intelligence. It's uh, fictitious, and, and that's a key distinction that, uh, to take on board. So what are the constraints? Um, synthetic constraints. If we look up at the cockpit, um, there might be a prize if you can spot what might be wrong with that picture. I'm hearing murmuring. I've never flown a fast jet aircraft without a helmet. Who's, who's, worn, who's worn a helmet with an oxygen mask? Yeah? It's not comfortable. All right, seven hours with that on. Takes a while to get used to. Actually, when we're in this kind of environment, what we see is that people kind of, you, you could do it in your seat. Um, typically walk in, we make them wear uniform, we make them wear their, their uh, utility kit. But it's a pretty comfortable environment. So physically, they're not stressed. Be mindful. Um, so that's one constraint for this. Second thing is cockpits. Um, if you wish for immersive simulators and you want a cockpit that is 
is a direct uh, replication of the real thing, what's the best thing to use? The real thing, and it's very expensive. So we have a way to do that. And so in, in this environment, what we've got is a bunch of touch screens that have you know, what would normally be a physical um, button switch, and, and it's all uh, simulated in that sense, em emulated. And so what, what we kind of impress upon the operators and, and the, the, the cockpits we have in particular in the ABTC are um, Typhoon and Tornado. It's not about training the individual to operate the system. It's about training the mind to use the capability that's inserted into that collective training environment. Right? And so if you were to say, am I going to become uh, you know, an above average operator of that aircraft by going to the ABTC, the answer is no. Is a mix. Um, so that is definitely uh, a limitation, but you know, one of the great benefits is that cost benefit, because these things probably cost, I don't know, 50th of the real thing. Not even that. Um, so hu hugely beneficial to take the um, fidelity of the cockpits down to a level that's acceptable to fool the brain whilst they're getting busy to worry about what's going on outside the cockpit, not what's inside it. And the same goes on for the joint fires tents. The only thing I would sort of raise with the joint fires teams, and you, and you can see it on this bottom right um, a display, is uh, it, it's a single focus. It's a flat screen. It's very difficult to get the same depth of perception that perhaps we might wish for. Um, you, you would want to look at different perspectives, and you would have teams you know, put out to try and get different sight lines, uh, you know, in a, from a land perspective. But we have experimented with um, virtual reality. Um, that, that is sort of emerging technology that could add benefit. But right now, as it, as it starts to synchronise, it's a little bit disorienting. So we're probably not there yet with what we need. Um, and, and in truth, what we find is that, that the folk that are coming in don't need that level of fidelity because it's just enough. But it is a limitation that you, you, we should be aware of. Um, the, the great thing, I suppose, is that uh, you know, wh whether you have um, whether you have a flat screen or whether you have some sort of immersive uh, or, or virtual reality, the fact that um, cause and effect can be displayed is hugely beneficial and, and provided it's time relevant again what you're trying to do is build up in the operator's mind and, and in this case the, the joint fires teams this notion of the um, uh, uh, oriented, uh, observe, orient, uh, decide and act loop the old OODA loop and they can actually start to process better what that actually means to them. It, it does lead to a more immersive environment. Okay, so a little bit about uh, the benefits or, or not. I might just switch back to uh, the laser pointer now. So um, I think if I were honest with myself as an operator but also as an exercise director, I've had more benefit through exercising through a virtual construct, in a, a, virtual live, uh, a virtual constructed environment. Why do I say that? Well, partly because you get the benefit of uh, truth in the debrief, because we recorded everything, uh, but also what we get is the uh, enriched environment. So if we're just going to do a com contrast and comparison, what you'll see in the two black um, uh, boxes there against the synthetic year versus live year is that um, whilst in synthetic we've just talked a lot about limited um, fidelity training devices, what we do have is a really rich battle space and you can pretty much pick and mix what you want to put in there. Um, my experience these days of the live environment is the battle space, space is constrained, both uh, from a uh, vertical perspective, but also from a size. And similarly, if we want to put entities into it, gone are the days as an air defender back in the good old F3 where I could just get airborne. Didn't used to, sometimes we didn't even use the brief. We'd just get airborne, we'd go to the Lake District, and it was called affiliation training. And I could guarantee in an hour, I'd probably get six intercepts of other fast jet type. If I went to the Lake District now, one, maybe. So you just, 
you know, the, the, the return, if you like, on investment is just not there. And if you try and plan for it, um, the one thing I will say is from, a, from a, uh, a UK perspective, if you have any doubt whether defence is maximising um, its, its sort of effects uh, overseas, every air system, every capability that we have is being used on operations. There is no fat left anywhere. And that's the problem. You cannot get hold of any trade anywhere. No one has the ability to participate. So it's only these huge exercises like Exercise Red Flag where nations plan two years in advance to get their people there. Whereas, actually, we could probably plan something for the virtual environment and we could have it all programmed up, ready to go 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. That's, that's how good it can be. Um, environmental factors. Now, who was I talking to about the weather? Who got rained on on the way in? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is one of the reasons I'm a huge fan of virtual environments and synth synthetics. It, they, synthetic environments, don't care whether it's raining outside, whether it's icy on the road, or if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, because you can make it look like a sunny summer's day. And, uh, and that's hugely valuable. It's very, very cost-effective in that sense, whereas if you try and do some of the work that we do, you end up having lots of contingencies. Am I flying a single wall, a split wall, a low wall? Do I have to kick players out because it's unsafe, there's too many people in, in the space and they can't see each other? You know, this is a major factor that we've got to consider. Um, this notion of uh, real system and environmental degradation and again, I said I owe my life to engineers, and I absolutely do, but I also have to thank them a lot for the fact they always blame me for breaking the aeroplane. Um, very complex beasts. And I don't think there was many times I flew uh, high-end aircraft such as Typhoon that something wasn't quite right or didn't quite work. And so we get really good at working around problems. Now, it's really hard to do that in the virtual environment because unless you've got a really intelligent degradation or a, um, an almost AI process that starts to take things down on a random basis, you can't stress the individual in that way. But we don't want to. But similarly, if you've got a critical asset like a, a suppression of enemy air defense asset, someone that's going to take down a surface-to-air missile site and his radar doesn't work, and that happens far too often in real life, I'm afraid, then your whole plan changes and you might have 20 aircraft about to go to do a mission and the critical player can't do his job. And so the collective outcome is that the mission is a fail, just for one asset. Now in the sim simulated environment, of course we can simulate that, but that's not what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve success. So you know, this, this is a reality, if you like, of, uh, of, of the complexity of the environment. Um, the other thing I will just say as well, so, some more fighters in here. Who's been shot at? Okay. Tell you what, it focuses the mind. And if you see a great big telegraph pole coming up through the clouds at you, um, then you really think twice about whether you're going to go back to that same area again. Okay, thank goodness it didn't actually hit. So, when we come back to the reality of what we can do with threats, very difficult to replicate the, the, the challenge and the emotional response to being targeted, all right? Um, the, the fight or f suppressing the fight or um, flight reflex and anger. Who thinks clearly when they're angry? I mean, generally, I mean, my wife tells me all the time, you know, you don't think clearly when you're angry. So we, we try and build a way to, to partition that um, emotion away from the mission delivery. But I tell you what, it really makes you angry when someone's trying to kill you. <laughs> you know? Just saying. Um, now, can we do that? Yes, we can, we can sort of irritate the operators to a point where they start to get angered. But again, that's not the objective. But it is a limitation. Um, and, you know, getting... Um, you know, this bit about uh, damage to kill out entities in the virtual environment, yes, we can replicate that quite well, and we can be very clear about when someone has been targeted and when they ha have to remove, and that will affect the outcome 
uh, of a plan, and it's a good way to demonstrate that, one of those learning points. In the live environment, it's incredibly difficult to, um, to kill paths and then remove effectively from an environment. And uh, just, just to sort of bring it into the modern context, um, I'm involved in uh, delivering the test for F35 out in, in the States uh, at Edwards. And the program, you know, we, we've been working really hard to get this program on track and deliver the, the flight test that, that will eventually get us the capability. And the last thing that we're still waiting for is the thing that allows us to do live kill removal during test. So when we know for sure a system has targeted one of the aircraft and whether that aircraft itself has been taken out of the fight. And that, when you've got a stealthy platform and you've got legacy systems on the ground, and it, it's a really, really complicated thing. So truth, getting to truth in the live environment is very, very difficult. And what I would say is in electronic warfare, um, we're almost past just plain electronic warfare because it's more electronic, space, cyber, everything and anything that has electrons and photons we need to consider. And we can kind of do both um, in, in virtual as well as uh, live environment. Okay, now a little bit of, um, I'm not sure that this is gonna play over too well. So what I will talk a little bit about these, these boundaries of limitations. I'm gonna go to the bright pointer. So this diagram at the top here talks about the limit of, so the, the ability to uh, overlap live versus synthetic. And there's a limit always with what we can do in live. I've kind of explained a little bit about what that might be. We're not actually gonna kill people out. There's a limit of synthetic. Well, you can't actually experience some of those stresses, the heat, the uh, emotional stress, the responses that you would normally get. Um, then there's also this notion of, well, the big individual uh, bubble, the team, and then the collective, which is the totality of everyone. And there's somewhere in there, there's got to be a sweet spot. So if we were going to look at one of my key exercises where we uh, train up future weapons instructors, uh, Cobra Warrior, then what we're doing is, uh, within this environment, we're tickling the edge of what we can do with, this, with the synthetics. And we may have a live player in there. Um, we've linked through uh, Link 16, which is a, a data link uh, system, you know, uh, an E3. We've linked typhoons into the, the, the facility that are live flying, all right? But it's, it's a really small, uh, really small overlap. What we see on the um, uh, typical ABT sex exercise, as you might imagine, is because it's a synth synthetic environment, is um, we're pretty much focused on the collective, this big area here, we kind of, edge on the uh, ability of what we might be able to do in a live environment. Some of it we could do live, but this is where we're targeting, the collective area that's in the, predominantly in the synthetic environment. They're the things we can't do. And then when we look at what my white force resource limits are, it might be the number of people I've got to fly the red entities on desktop computers, or it might be just conceptually that uh, we don't have people who are experienced in that environment. And so again, it's constrained. So really what this diagram is saying to you is be smart about what you ask for and be smart about how you plan for it because there are some things we just can't do. And I was, um, so I was on the other end of the, the, the lectern uh, a couple of weeks ago. I went to a lecture with my youngest daughter uh, about space travel and uh, it, it was a free lecture at Lincoln University. Who'd have thought it? And I, I thought genuinely I was going to get to hear about uh, you know, the time-space continuum and everything else. And it, and it totally wasn't that. Um, so I got surprised by that. But then more, I suppose more importantly was the, the response of the audience to the lecturers. And uh, I guess we'll see how questions go to that and I'll maybe play that one back to you. But uh, it was it, fascinating nonetheless. It was about constraints and don't ask for something that you can't achieve. Okay. Um, so what is the future? We're getting close to wrapping up now. Um, and I guess with everything, we don't stand still. Uh, we've got to always think about how we can adapt uh, and achieve greater success. So the two future steps that we're looking at is uh, an interim that bridges us to um, a, 
if you like, a, a distributed uh, training capability for air and an interim uh, air synthetic training capability. So that is coming online around June uh, time this year. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll bridge out to the Defence Operational Training Capability, DOTCR, um, by October of uh, 2020. And really what that's going to start to look at is linking in um, primarily uh, Typhoon to um, a hooked uh, and improved synthetic environment, but also the E3. So we're pretty much focusing on that high-end uh, air capability to begin with. And of course, that will in time build. Um, so what, what you'll see is that all force elements at all uh, main operating bases will then start to plug into this uh, new environment and will operate in a more distributed way. That will allow, if you like, a routine uh, and regularised uh, ability to train. And where in the past there's always been this conversation about what is the live virtual mix for flying? How do we balance off the cost of that uh, against the life expectancy of any platform? Um, it probably won't escape you to know that all of those assumptions that we may have had 15 years ago are way out way out. So again, it's different for every platform. It's mostly different for every individual as well. And what, what my bio perhaps didn't say was that the, the, the fine three years that I spent in, embedded in industry at Wharton with um, BA Systems, within those three years, I probably flew a thousand hours in the simulator before I even got in the cockpit. And that made a huge difference to both converting to fly the aircraft, but then actually being able to make an assessment of it, you know, when we finally came to testing Typhoon. Now, when we start looking at the collecting environment, wouldn't it be great if you're spending a 1,000 hours in the collecting environment before you actually have to save the nation? Because that might just happen. Again, some of those assumptions that we had as to who the threat would be have changed, and they will continue to change. Things called strategic shocks. So the real benefit, if you like, of growth and capability is having um, an architecture, having a network, a system that is adaptable and flexible. And that's really where we're going with um, not just the ABTC, but beyond as well. And part of that growth is having now, rather than just those low fidelity devices, we're able to pull in high fidelity devices that that bit that I said, we don't always want to stress the operators, the pilots. Well, now we can start to overlay those stresses too and get a much more realistic impression of what capability we're likely to be able to deliver. And that's one of my other roles is, if you like, the uh, third party, the second party individual that steps aside from everything and it, with a very impartial uh, look says, yes, you can do this or no, you can't. Uh, and then have that, um, you know, the honesty to tell... Um, both my seniors and the politicians, that it probably wouldn't be a great idea to go you know, uh, downtown in this environment until we've done a bit more uh, work on it. And then looking uh, even further forward at um, the, the .CR uh, capability for 2020, um, what we anticipate is, uh, if you like, a hub and spoke um, environment that is centred at, at RF Waddington, but then we'll go further out uh, internationally too. We'll be able to link to um, all MOBs and their devices, including Lightning, but that's difficult because of the classification nature of that platform. Not impossible, but difficult. Um, and then year upon year, just build that volume up so that it becomes routine and people will just hook into the environment and then start to... Um, benefit from a more regularised uh, exercise plan. And thus, if you like, the, the higher volume of training um, will, uh, and, I, and I think it, it, it absolutely will get to the fact that we'll enhance the live training environment. It won't replace it, it won't uh, negate it, but it will enhance, uh, and therefore we should see a capability rise. Now, of course, it's not just the air environment that's... Uh, that's doing this, it's, it's both, uh, well, it's all, it's the um, land, maritime, and the joint environment uh, as well. And the one thing I will say about the, the joint domain is it's all those things that connect everything else together. And as an intelligence professional as well, so I'm head of air intelligence is one of my roles, uh, and head of air cyber, 
that's precisely where I would look for the year. It's, it's all those weak spots that we then could start to um, stress and exercise throughout. So, I'm going to take a quick sip, but um, I think we're pretty much there. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, the Air Battle um, Space Training Centre. Look, born of an urgent requirement, some fine thinkers that wanted to get to a way to train the mind, not the body, and allowed us to exercise and adapt to the contemporary warfighting environment. That has changed and will continue to change over time, and so this is why this facility will adapt. We talked a little bit about the history. You know, remember the wheel of change in the global context, absolutely front and center, and the typical air training day emulates what we would do in a live fly exercise. So right now, that same cycle that's going on out at Red Flag at Nellis is the same approach that we would have in the ABTC. The virtual environment doesn't care whether it's raining or snowing outside. It doesn't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning because it can always be sunny if you want it to be sunny. Or conversely, if it's sunny outside, you can make it really difficult uh, within the environment. And, of course, from a land perspective, um, being able to get to truth data, being able to uh, interlink at low cost the effects that can be delivered by air power, um, particularly for those air, air land integration teams and joint fires teams, is invaluable and became critical to our success in Afghanistan. Um, live and synthetics, well, you know, there are constraints to both. There is no doubt about it. Um, and we talked a little bit about futures. I, um, you know, sometimes I think that, that there, we, we haven't been bold enough here. And I think sometimes we feel constrained by what we have available to us now. I also think that we've had visionaries in the past, and some of those are amongst you, where we know we can take a leap of faith. There will be a technology uh, gap, but there will also be breakthroughs. And so in some of these areas, we can take the opportunity. And we don't need to necessarily spend you know, millions of pounds to do it. We can be innovative. And um, I'm constantly amazed at the teams that we have available to us from a whole force perspective, be that the engineering support team, whether it's the white force contractors that support us, um, they all want to do a fantastic job, and they all do, and they innovate every single day, whether it's just to keep the facility running or whether it's to innovate in how we get people to learn. They're constant, they're constant learners. They do this, they come and listen, they learn, they understand, and then they translate that back into uh, an enriched training environment. And... Um, what, I will, what I will finish on, and I'm going to go back to my notes because I was imp impressed by what um, the OC of the unit uh, wrote down. He said, well, look, and finally, I want to leave you with three points. I want to leave you with uh, things that focus on uh, and that really is promoted at the ABTC, and that's of excellence, of widening the training reach, and uh, a better, tr a better uh, uh, learning experience. And so... In order to approach the excellence, we have to review what we do within the training. We conduct the daily execute review, um, so that's the, the debrief, if you like, and, and they do that, obviously, with a training uh, audience. It allows them to focus on their learning and hopefully to reflect upon the experience afterwards. Outside the training, uh, outside the training and uh, facilitators need to review the service that they've just provided, just like I'll be debriefing myself on this uh, lecture and what I could have done better, because uh, in order to improve what they do, they need to wrap that back into the following serial uh, if they found what they'd planned for didn't work out. And then as they look to widen the training reach, um, the key is to retain a focused approach to the primary training audience, i.e. the people that come into the uh, facility, but at the same time, exploiting the training opportunity um, more broadly. So in other words, it's all those personnel that are supporting the training. And on top of this, there's the opportunity to engage with visitors and observers at all levels, and if nothing else, to sow the seeds uh, of their own future learning or education. 
And finally, the focus is a better learning experience. And it's related to the, excellent, to the excellence point, but involves getting the exercise execution right. There can't be failure in that sense. So uh, if you like, the only execution errors are with the participants and not with the white force or the facilities. And it's how do we get to that immersive and the cognitive approach to make sure that the brain is trained and uh, once we've achieved that, then, of course, learning has occurred. So um, I'm going to wrap up there uh, in order that we can have some uh, questions. Uh, I didn't start with an apology, but I will finish with one. Those that know me that normally speak know that I don't refer to notes because I normally learn or I write what I'm writing. I just haven't had time to do all of that to, to present to you. What I will impress upon you is that um, from, a, from a facility, the ABTC is world class. And I've seen a lot of these facilities across the world. What the team do is fabulous. What it has done for the nation uh, in protecting our forces overseas through uh, mission training and to a degree some rehearsal for the Joint Fires team has been outstanding over the years and it deserves the investment that it's getting. Um, I caution though, and I always will do this, that we can't solely rely upon it. It augments, it doesn't replace. And that there is a real benefit to putting someone at risk. For the same reason then, uh, you know, you need to understand how you yourself react when someone's trying to hit you, kill you, uh, cause damage, harm your loved ones. And we can't do that in the synthetic environment. It's really hard. I mean, I know some techniques. I won't, do, I won't practice them on you now, uh, but, but I do know some. Um, but, but it's really, really hard, and that's, that's the truth of it. So, so that's a, you know, for me, that's a key limitation, but it shouldn't stop us. But the key tenet is augments, doesn't replace. Let's keep investing in it. And a bit like we're doing here, we're investing in each other. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Um, I hope you've enjoyed what uh, I've presented to you today. And, of course, I'd welcome questions uh, afterwards. Thank you.